Hello, Mr. Worthington. Thank you for agreeing to do this interview with My us today. My pleasure. Lovely to have you here. Um, so I was doing a bit of research on you. I was fascinated to read your bio, I have to admit. Uh, you were a founding editor, or you are a founding editor of the Chana Sun, um, a veteran of both the Second World War and the Korean War, and a platoon commander in the Korean War. Um, as a journalist, you also covered the trial of uh, Jack Ruby, the Arab and Israeli Six-Day War, the Nigerian Civil War, and many more. Um, and you also covered the Battle of Athabeth in Erdra in 1988. Uh, Mr. Worthington, we're with the U.S. Air Force. You are the son of a major general, and you covered major wars and battles. Um, we, can we assume that you're an expert in military affairs and battles and war? I think anybody who claims that yeah. is being foolish, because okay. all kinds of wars are different. Yeah. All I will say that I've been to, uh, in a career, maybe 30 or 40 yeah. wars, revolutions, oh. crises, whatever you want to call them sort of specialty, specialized in that a long time. Yeah. And since, you know, in the later years, the war in uh, Angola, the Civil War, right. and then, uh, and then of course, the Eritrea thing, which, yeah. which always interested me, but I knew absolutely very little about Eritrea yeah. until going there in 1988 yeah. uh, with, a, with a, another person to film what was happening in that right. civil, so-called civil war, war of independence right. in Ethiopia. Yeah. And it was a, uh, an eye-opener, an education for me. Yeah. How did it come about that you were, you ended up traveling to Eritrea to see this? Well, I think the, the, the television station, I think it eventually appeared on uh, PBS in the States or something, parts okay. of it. Uh, and they knew I'd been, I'd been to uh, Angola, spent a lot of time in Angola yeah. in that civil war where the, again, the rebels, UNITA rebels were winning right. until they were abandoned yeah. by the United States, yeah. which the United States tends to do occasionally, <laughs> and uh, went to, um, through Sudan okay. and were taken at night yeah. into, uh, Eritrea and had absolutely no idea where it was, where we were, and where we were basically taken to was right be into the area okay. of Alphabet, but didn't know it at the time. Did you fly in or were you? No, no, by, by truck. By truck, wow. They're bringing supplies in. Right. And, uh, you know, no lights or anything in the middle yeah. of the night, and yeah. uh, they're always afraid of Ethiopian planes coming over. Because Ethiopia in those days, had uh, probably the largest mechanized uh, army in in, uh, in Black Africa, yeah. uh, and they were run by a, a Marxist mm -hmm. homicidal psychopath, if you like, in yeah. Mangistu, yeah. Uh, and Eritrea, which had been the British had turned it over to the. Uh, Ethiopians to sort of manage for a while, right. and then Mengistu just seized the country, yeah. and the uh, and Eritreans began their struggle, a 30-year struggle to yeah. fight for independence, yeah. and the EPLF at that time, the Eritrean Liberation People's Liberation Front, mm -hmm. were the main fighters of it, and it was interesting because, you know, they didn't call themselves soldiers; right. they were fighters. And it was surprising to find so many women mm -hmm. in the front ranks right. fighting. And, uh, and we were there seeing people and visiting hospitals or whatever. Yeah. And then uh, this, this battle erupted. We did, knew at the time, didn't know at the time what it was. Right. I would say the battle of alphabet such as it is is one of the really few decisive battles in history, if you like. It's been compared with the Dien Bien Phu mm -hmm. fight in, in uh, Vietnam, right. which, which broke the spirit and the capabilities of the French army and, uh, and, and meant that, that North Vietnam had won the North. Right. This was the, the, 
th and these, were, I think there were something like three good uh, experienced Ethiopian divisions. They attacked the, the trench area mm -hmm. of, uh, of the Eritreans on, in the mountains and were beaten back. What was interesting is that they, we know now, didn't know then, they were preparing for another mass attack. But uh, instead, the Eritreans surprised them by attacking them on two flanks and driving them back. And when the Ethiopian division tried to retreat, they ran into an ambush uh, that the Eritreans got behind them. Yeah. Uh, and they must have lost, you, you know, they would have lost in prisoners and dead maybe 18, 20,000. Wow. You know, it's a huge thing. And we were in the trenches there, you see, when my friend Rob Roy, who was the cameraman there, right. you know, the bodies were strewn out. And, the, and there were all sorts of skeletons from previous bodies. And then we went into the, you know, into the uh, army headquarters area. Quite interesting bodies all over the place, hammer and sickles all over the place, and uh, and from my point of view as a Canadian, found in the kitchens uh, gifts from Sida, uh, wheat flour for the refugees, for the, and the army had taken it all, Ethiopian army, and the same in in alphabet in the town, on all the the storefronts were selling cooking oil. Wheat flour that was was for for refugees. I was dead against foreign aid going into yeah. Ethiopia because going straight to the army. Okay. Canada has always denied this, but it was uh, uh, you know it, it really mm -hmm. very interesting from that aspect. And you know we went that's when we we wanted to. Uh, I wanted to then talk to some prisoners. Right. At that time we didn't didn't know how big the thing we knew it was a huge battle because there were the roads were just strewn with dead and, and some of the bodies like cartoon pancakes you know with trucks and tanks running over them they're just flattened out and very hot very dry and uh, I was keen to, to talk to some mm -hmm. prisoners and kept asking the Eritreans, saying, look, if you got a prisoner. And they were very hesitant. The Eritreans. You know, the, the Eritreans were saying, well, yes, it's fine, we don't mind that, but uh, you know, just wait a while. And I couldn't understand. I, you know, all I wanted was three, four, five guys, right. <laughs> preferably officers who spoke English. Right. You could ch chat with them. Yeah. So they finally said, well, we've done it. This is about the third day, and said, uh, if you drive to a certain spot uh, at about 4, 4.30 in the afternoon, we'll have your prisoners. And I immediately thought, oh, geez, you know, why didn't you just bring them here? Right. You know, go off to somewhere. Are they going to be real or they not? So we went there, and there's a bunch of people, you know, other people there. And then uh, I say, well, okay, who are the prisoners? And then, you know, I've never seen anything like it. Way down about half a mile, yeah. around a hill, yeah. came an absolute river of prisoners. Oh my goodness. There must have been 10,000. And, and there's another stream coming in. They, they got all the prisoners together. What they were afraid of, yeah. were doing it in the evening or uh, when the sun was starting to go down a little, uh, they were afraid the Ethiopians would send aircraft over and shoot them up. And so you had this, we were standing there and, and yards away, when they come into fallen bare feet, uh, all, <clears throat> you know, fairly healthy looking people, right. but uh, n a never ending stream of prisoners. So we walked among them to see who spoke English and, and you know, a surprising number did. Right. A lot were officers were all together, and none of them really wanted to go back to Ethiopia. Wow. They were 
they they were they didn't want to be fighting the Eritreans. Eritreans were fighting hard. You know, they, they fought well, mm -hmm. uh, and they were afraid of what would happen to them. The Ethiopians were afraid. Of the Ethiopians were afraid of what would happen if they went back. Yeah. And, uh, and apparently, what had happened was the general commanding the Ethiopians mm -hmm. at this great defeat was taken back and summarily executed, wow. you know, which is killed. And this wasn't a good thing for morale. Yeah. And you know, the world was against Eritrea, yeah. no matter what they say. And uh, we'd go in to see refugee camps there and, and the, uh, and the prisoners of war. The Red Cross would have nothing to do with the prisoners of war. Okay. You know, the Red Cross you would think would be independent but it was for, uh, it was on the Ethiopian side. Okay. And they wouldn't check on when, to how the, the Eritreans treated the prisoners. For the Eritreans, of course, it was in their interest to treat them well. Right. And because uh, none of those soldiers really wanted to go back, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. under the circumstances. So how did you find that, did you find that Eritreans treated the soldiers well? Especially in comparison to the Geneva Convention, would you say that Oh, I, the, well, standards? you see, I didn't think, uh, I think they complied with it. Uh, they didn't have to operate under it, and nobody was checking them. Mm -hmm. But they, I think it was in their interest to have uh, homeless children and uh, refugees mm -hmm. and the soldiers being treated well. Right. Uh, a far different uh, uh, way than they were treated by themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found the, uh, uh, I found, you know, uh, even when I went back 10 years later, yeah. when things had changed, uh, there, was, there was a remarkable lack of corruption. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the ministers, when they, when they began, to, when they formed the government, and when they got the independence ceremonies in 93, uh, the ministers weren't driving Mercedes. Right. Yeah. They weren't living in lush offices. Uh, and this is when you went back in 1998? And it? this was at 1998. And uh, uh, you know, went into the disputed area of Badme, is it? Badme, Badme that area, yeah. Yeah. where it was happening. So you went there yes. at the time. What was your impression of the situation there? Well, it, uh, uh, nobody wanted the Ethiopians there. And for the life of me, I had no understanding why the Ethiopians wanted it. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing there that's, that seems of value. Uh, it's hard to drive, there are no roads, yeah. all that. And the, the people there were, were, uh, wanted, had no use for the Ethiopians. Uh, uh, and I suspect the Ethiopians had <laughs> soldiers didn't want to be in Badme. And then, but then the, the battle, the fighting shifted south of Asmara on the right. border there. Yeah. And, I, and I gather that the, uh, going down that, to that area, that the Ethiopians suffered a lot of casualties. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, again, that was where you could see an awful lot of the integration okay. of women into the, into the combat forces. You mentioned that. You mentioned the role of women in... Yeah, I, it was... Uh, I, I was always interested yeah. because in, in, in Canada around that time, it was when, a time when the Canadians were debating and talking, you know, it goes on forever in Canada, right. of women in the armed forces. Yeah. And uh, they were bringing... They wanted, for example, they wanted 15% of the armed forces to be... Uh, Aboriginal people okay. in Canada, no problem with that. Right. Uh, but then they wanted 15%, uh, or they were talking about it in those days, to have women in the armed forces. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought uh, they should be seeing what the Eritreans do, okay. because roughly talking to them, I have no, just know what I'm told. Right. Uh, and they, the Eritreans were saying quite seriously, 
that if you had roughly 30% women mm -hmm. in the combat arm, uh, the relationship was n a normal kind of functioning. They did, there were, and I saw them myself, women platoon commanders and company commanders in positions of authority, right. having no trouble or being men around. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were trained and they knew what they were doing. That's all that a soldier wants is having his superiors knowing what he's doing. Right, yeah. Uh, and they s said that if they had 30%, it was normal, but if they had 5%, right. 8%, or lower than that, you tended to get jealousies, because you had love affairs, right. you had the men reluctant to put the women at risk, mm -hmm. sort of thing. You had a lot of problems. Right. Uh, to this day, the Canadians always make a fuss about women serving okay. in the armed forces in combat roles. How yeah. much would you say? And now they have their certificates around 2%. Around 2%. They, it, it, that's too low. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they adjust it. There's all kinds of sort of uh, certain problems. They've ironed them out a lot, but right. but they've never really caught on to the same degree. But I think the women, you know, because Eritrea is not an environment where male and female are sort of on an equal level. I think. And, and extraordinarily, because they're fighting a war, they had no option. Okay. They had to bring, I think, yeah. women into the thing. And I think it is significant that they never viewed themselves as a military regime. Right. You had the fighters, you didn't have soldiers. Right. Fighters, and I, uh, you had, had strongest, I don't know all the internal pressures that went on, but you know, there is no, uh, uh, and this is the second time in there. I wasn't in Asmara mm -hmm. the first time, but the second time in Asmara and at the coast, there is no real feeling of internal tension. Yeah. People got along well, and uh, it was the, in the middle of a war even in Asmara. You had uh, the main street would be blocked off with, with uh, cafes and yeah. coffee and things. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, uh, it had some problems because difficult for a foreigner. There weren't that many, not that many foreign journalists even were interested there, I think. Yeah. And uh, they, uh, very difficult because you, well, they would only use cash. Mm -hmm. You know, you they couldn't use a credit card. Right. So whatever cash you go with, you've got to nurse fairly carefully. I saw with uh, one of your interviews that you did with um, the Honorable President Issa Turkey that you asked, you told him that one way to get foreigners into the country was to allow credit cards yeah. and to let the banks take care of them. So can you speak in, on the nature of of, uh, of the president and what you've witnessed with him throughout your, your time, your, your long period of time in your association with Russia? I think your, your president was very wary of foreigners and, uh, and any country should be. Uh, Canadian soldiers, when they go someplace, are basically all they want to do is get home. They have no aspirations of taking over. I think they get on with the people, yeah. sometimes better than American or British or something, mm -hmm. because they're. Uh, you, I, it's, it's my view that Canadian soldiers are the the best social workers mm -hmm. and humanitarians mm -hmm. and fighters, if you need that, you need because they're always sort of doing something, building a school or fixing water or you know, doing that sort of thing, and then want to get out. Uh, I, I don't have the same faith in the aid programs. Aid people tend to take over and want to do things their way. And I think uh, your president is very wise, or was very wise, to be wary of aid because aid has become, can become like a, uh, it's, it's like bringing a magpie into the house, mm. you know, takes over. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and you lose control. And then the aid programs can pay big money to local people. And, uh, and, and 
the local people, smart ones, are needed for the country. And that's why I remember, uh, and this applies to, to Kenya at one point, uh, when they're putting in roads. Same as they were true, they're building roads. And the road, you build a road from Asmara to some small place, you've got an immediate brain drain. People from the, from the suburbs and the boondocks are going to be tempted to flood into the city. And the very people you need, wherever they are. And, you know, this is, uh, uh, and this, this, you know, violates the culture that works. Uh, and I think, I think foreign aid is a corrupting influence. Countries that get, get it, corruption quickly follows. And I think your president was quite aware of this, mm -hmm. and I think was trying to control it. I don't know how effective that's been. Yeah. And I suspect the way to control it sometimes seems harsh. Yeah. But I think you, you have to look at why he was, was doing it. Yeah. Uh, and you, you, know, you, you had an unusual president, because he started off as a sort of student leader and you don't often find student leaders who rise to be wartime leaders right. and then can, can uh, become uh, peace song leaders. Right. Usually you have an interruption, somebody else takes over. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, and I'm, <clears throat> I remember when the, uh, the yeah. guy who was head of the Congo was passing through around the time I was there. Uh, passing through Eritrea? Yeah. And was, was being, you know, seeing the president. On, he, was on, he was a scoundrel, you know, one of the many. And I think uh, everybody was laughing at it because the pres your president uh, saw and took him down to one of the local bars for a drink without any bodyguard or anything. Yeah. And Kabila, I think it was, or yeah. whoever it was, insisted on his bodyguards. <laughs> he, and, he, and they wouldn't let him into the, um, into the cafe or the bar. They had to stay outside. Oh, the bodyguards had to the stay The bodyguards. Okay. And, the, and the Congolese president was very nervous. <laughs> upset. Yeah. And here, the, the difference yeah. seemed to be in those days with the um, the Eritrean president mixing with the with the people, right. and the and the Congolese guy stiff and and couldn't wait to get out of there. <laughs> <laughs> and you you mentioned earlier when we were talking before we started the interview about um, President Isias and uh, his reaction to um, the African Union and when he went. To well, his his I think when 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 it first got independence in the African Union was making a big fuss over the this newly entered this state in Africa. And he went to their meeting, I think it's now the, what do they call it? It was the Organization of African Union. Now it's, I think it's the African Union. Yeah. But he went there and uh, red carpet and everything and instead of, uh, of sort of being the newcomer, little guy listening to all these elder statesmen, in his speech he lit into them and said, you know, they've got to change that the, the, they, can't, they cannot keep blaming corruption on the foreigners or Israel or places, that they, they shouldn't be driving Mercedes Benzes, they shouldn't be living high on the hog, they shouldn't be going on shopping trips to Paris, they shouldn't uh, be corrupt. Every one of them is running a corrupt regime. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and as far as he was concerned, Eritrea was not going to go this route. Mm -hmm. Their ministers were going to be go working you know, for the people or going to be restrained in this thing. And, and foreign aid was a corrupting influence. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely correct. But nobody dares say that to Africa. Right. They all want to get in good with them, yeah. or the form. And the, you know, the Americans, British, Canadians, they're all being 
nicey-nicey mm -hmm. to them for, mm -hmm. for f God knows what reason. Uh, you know, why we, this is a different area, but why we should be tolerating uh, a country like Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. which is, uh, uh, <coughs> defies every value that we subscribe to. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it bewilders me. We finally have a government in Canada that is now selecting countries. Uh, I think it was odd because I think countries would have, some countries would have been lining up to, to give aid mm -hmm. to Eritrea right. on condition that they control how this aid is spent or something, okay. which, which again can be corrupting also. And I think one of the interesting things that when, right after independence, I think they had foreign aid was was building or, or repairing the road to the coast, and the World Monetary Fund or whatever it was sized up how much they were giving and how it was going to go, and they had x x million to do this thing with a certain amount off to pay bribes and, right. to, and to go into people's pockets. Right. And Eritrea became the first country ever to give a refund. <laughs> they didn't have the, cor the corruption didn't exist yeah. for that thing, yeah. which is so unusual. And to me, that would have been a, a really good international story. Right. Why do you think that um, Eritrea's successes or the positive aspects of that, everything that you've spoken about hasn't I been reflected in the media, I think, international I, media? I think people don't go there, mm. or they haven't been there, and they, if, 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 if there's not some reason to go there, I guess, you know, and these days uh, they want to save money. And the trouble is it's too easy with the, uh, uh, for instance, right now, Eritrea has very stern censorship laws. Uh, censorship laws don't really bother me. Right. I mean, if you go into a country uh, and you can't write things from in there, you can always write them when you get out. But, but, but you shouldn't necessarily confuse censorship with repression. People, you know, it does. I mean, we, Canada, for instance, has uh, uh, a right to know uh, uh, transparency. But this, the right to know, can be blocked. They, it's the right to to know what they want you to know. And 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 we always have a fuss. The government is holding something back. Uh, I think uh, that's the nature of governments. Uh, I don't know what, what, what's happening in Eritrea with regards to, uh, you know, if, if, if people are being taken off the streets or put into, you, you, can, you could, if you go to Asmara or one of the cities, you quickly get a feel yeah. if this is a repressive state. Uh, anytime I was there, in, in 88 or 98, it wasn't. It was a place that was filled with, with, I think, justifiable uh, pride of achievement. And I mean, nothing can take away from it, what they did to beat, the, to win this war, and, and this, and this, and this battle, which uh, they should never have been able to win and did. Um, how would you describe your experiences um, or your feelings in Eritrea as opposed to um, other countries that you've traveled to? Is there a different sense that you get when you're in Eritrea? Well, I found after Eritrea, and I've done a lot of over the years, right. I, I don't even pretend to be an expert on Africa, but I've been to a lot of African countries right. and been to a lot of the, uh, uh, you know, when the countries were emerging into independence, just preceding that, I remember going, I spent a lot of time in the Congo, 
is independent. Congo has all kinds of problems. And then going to South Africa, and I preferred the Congo. I thought the Congo had a had a sort of uh, a liberation or an exuberance that the repressive regime in South Africa in those days didn't have. I didn't like South Africa. I found it exceedingly uncomfortable, you know. Which many people will not say about ethnicity. Well, and I think I think basically journalists felt that way. They did. They didn't. I don't think they would compare it like I did with the Congo. Right. Apartheid began to disintegrate right. after the Congo. Yeah. And by the time it, it was abandoned, uh, it was over, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. you know, they had realized their mistake. And I think, uh, uh, I think, in a way, South Africa, at the end, became the only repressive state that black Africans were trying to get into because there were jobs mm -hmm. and more things, and, and it was loosening up. Yeah. But then, so I, if I preferred the Congo to South Africa, I, I preferred Eritrea to any country in Africa. I thought it was the, I thought if they had followed the example of Eritrea, it was potentially the hope of Africa. And I think Africa as a continent is uh, dysfunctional. And I think the, I think foreign aid has a, had a lot to do with it. There's the, the lot people with, with with brains, ability, and things get into the power structure, and they seem to uh, do okay financially. Mm -hmm. And it's like uh, it's like the Canadian Indians, right. the Indi the chiefs of these two hundred tribes you've got in this country. Yeah. Get more money than can get, wind up more money than the prime minister. Yeah. It's the people in there who don't get it. So if you give foreign aid mm -hmm. into the into a repressive regime, all they then have to do is put all their excess money that they would need for food or whatever into a weaponry of the army, right. which they've they've done over the years. Yeah. Uh, and I, that'll straighten itself out eventually. Mm -hmm. But, uh, uh, and you have places like Botswana, which seem to have functioned somehow. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and I thought Savimbi mm -hmm. had the, the right idea in, in Angola. Mm -hmm. uh, and we fed his civil war in Angola. He lost it when he lost all support. But uh, the government he had, Remember, when it got independence, there were three parties. There was the Marxist party, uh, and then, uh, then another party, and then Unita. Well, the Marxist one uh, staged a coup mm -hmm. and took the government, and, uh, and we all subscribed to it. Mm -hmm. We began yeah. giving aid to it. And, and, and the Red Cross, again, went into there only on the Marxist side. Uh, yeah. And uh, and Savimbi, I thought, was a great leader, way ahead of his time. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Gavald had to uh, had certain support from South Africa, but then they abandoned him completely. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned um, that Eritrea was considered uh, to be the the hope for Africa, and that was um, a rhetoric that was pretty prominent, pretty popular um, around the days of independence. But I have noticed that there's been a, a, a dramatic change in how um, the international media describes Eritrea now as opposed to... The personality I am, I guess, I read about Eritrea, one of the ten most dangerous countries in the world to visit. Uh, well, I find that intriguing. You know, I've spent a, a career going to dangerous countries, right. and 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 it's and it's it may be dangerous for tourists or something. It's not necessarily dangerous for people who live there, mm -hmm. and and how you define danger. Uh, I mean, Cuba, for instance, is on the list of dangerous countries. Cuba is not dangerous right. if you unless unless you're up to mischief. 
I've just come back from Mexico, and people say, oh, Mexico, you know, yeah. they're killed. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not down in Mexico to buy drugs right. yeah. or, or find trouble. If you want to find trouble, you'll find it anywhere. Mm -hmm. My experience there, it was a country that was really not immersed in drugs, as, as some are. Uh, I'm very skeptical of countries. I think uh, North Korea uh, is a dangerous country. Uh, it's not dangerous if you're there as a, as a visitor. It's dangerous to the world, and you've got a maniac running it. You know, you don't have a maniac running other countries. The other thing I found about Eritreans he, uh, abroad is that most Eritreans have a tremendous sense of, of patriotism for their country. Most of them are, uh, and I think they have to, are sending money back to their families, looking after there, which, which may be a, a necessity. I know Canada objected to this sort of 2% income tax or taxing rate, which, which, which I don't argue that. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure you need the compulsory aspect to it. I, I, it struck me that Eritreans, everyone's, I meet driving a taxi or wherever, seems to be quite aware that they're needed or their money is needed back home, right. and they seem to have a, a, a love of country and for what it did mm -hmm. that is unusual. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's what I would hope mm -hmm. Canadians would feel, mm -hmm. you know, about their country. Yeah. Speaking of um, Eritreans in Canada, you wrote many articles on the Battle of Aquabeth, um, and many Canadians of Eritrean origin heard about that battle through your articles. Um, amongst the battles that you covered, how would you describe that particular battle compared to all the other battles that you've witnessed and that you've written about? They're all somewhat different mm -hmm. and have different things. I don't think anyone, any battle was as decisive and conclusive mm -hmm. as that one. Uh, uh, you know, for example, historically, one of the, one of the great defensive battles of all time was the battle that Canadians fought in Korea at Cap Yong. Okay. One battalion yeah. of maybe six, seven hundred men mm -hmm. fought off something like three or four thousand Chinese and beat them. Okay. Uh, th this was, a, uh, uh, I have no idea of how many Eritreans were involved at Alphabet, mm -hmm. but in, in two, three days, they, they defeated, crushed, uh, annihilated, if you like, an army of about 25,000. I mean, uh, that, that these opens were finished at that time. Then it was a negotiation of, of fiddling around and moving in and getting the, the sort of peace thing. Yeah. I think it was the most, uh, arguably the most decisive battle I can, I can remember. And I think if you wanted to go back to, it was certainly the, the largest battle in Africa since World War II. And I don't even know what battle in Africa, probably in North Africa, yeah. at Tobruk or something, you'd get a bigger one, yeah. with tanks and things. But, and you know, it's amazing to me, sight, to see uh, Ethiopian tanks, Russian tanks, being turned around and their guns being turned around and using against the people they came from. And, uh, and uh, uh, you suddenly realize that this, this, these were people who are not going to be stopped. Uh, and you know, one of the, the great memorable sites, and I guess I, it's still in Asmara, I don't know. Do you know Asmara at all? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, they, they have the, the the tank junkyard yeah. with literally thousands of tanks, yeah. guns, yeah. vehicles, yeah. bandoliers of ammunition, everything heaped up there. Yeah, I, I at the time, uh, I th 
was arguing with the Eritrean that they should preserve this mm -hmm. as a museum. Right, yeah. You know, put uh, a fence around it, <laughs> charge some money to it, paths going through it. Yeah. Because I've never seen anything like that. And you can realize when you see this mass of, uh, of weaponry yeah. that they've captured and dumped there, you can see why, they, why the Soviet Union imploded and went broke mm -hmm. at that time. You know, it's just uh, too much. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think they ever did, but I mean, it was, uh, it's a memorable sight, yeah. yes, that thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I don't know if I mentioned earlier the, your underground, the hospital yeah. carved out of the mountain, yeah. which I think, uh, again, should be turned into some, some sort of museum because I, th I suppose the, the Vietnamese do that okay. and have done that, and the North Koreans did that too. Right. But uh, there's nothing, uh, uh, and, and you know, they had living quarters. I remember we were, when we were staying in the mountain, yeah, yeah. You're, you're going into a mountain. Uh, so it was in, and it was inside the mountain. You're in the mountain. You inside. Inside. And uh, I remember in one of those, was staying in uh, at around midnight came out to go to the bathroom mm -hmm. okay maybe maybe 30 40 yards away and got totally lost you did. could not could, couldn't get back uh, you know and I was didn't want to go too far kept and and I couldn't find the entrance because all you're doing is looking at a hillside okay. and then and then finally some sentry. I wonder what, what I'm doing prowling around. I said, you know, he laughed and then took me there. Yeah. Ten yards away, the entrance. But you would never guess, you would never be able to see it. I wouldn't have found it at wow. all. And if some aircraft is coming over, they would never have spotted it. Wow. No. It's incredible. Yeah, it was, it was very, very clever and very yeah. wise and very able. Yeah. During your time in Ashabat, I wanted to ask, how were you treated? Um, what what was what were what were your daily activities while you were there? How long were you there for? Well, I guess we were there when the battle started, and uh, I guess several days after it ended. And uh, I think that changed the whole. Uh, uh, you know, we were sort of guests of the uh, EPLF at the time which were, was pretty well organized and, uh, and weren't told anything. We had never heard of Alphabet mm -hmm. until we uh, were taken there and were at the thing and could hear all the noise. Uh, but we were treated very civilly, very, uh, without, you know, uh, without even knowing where we were. But you're in the hands of people you you really don't know, you're, you're trusting them. And once the, the, the tide had turned and won, had complete free range running over their Ethiopian headquarters and, and seeing all the mischief there and seeing the Canadian, you know, to me when they, I see all the, the foreign aid, wheat flour and things in the army kitchens you know, which is one of the one of the stipulations of foreign aid that it doesn't go to the army, but it was um, really a privilege to see the thing and all the and and the any argument of the uh, Soviet influence in the, in the Ethiopians it was all Soviet, which which would rile a lot of the Ethiopian army too, because this was a an army that was trained by the Americans one time. And then the, the, uh, the Soviets abandoned Eritrea when, when Eri you know, the, they supported Eritrea against Ethiopia when the Americans were there. When the Americans left, the Soviets suddenly changed sides. And I think that was an eye-opener to many Eritreans in command that they, you can't trust any of these big powers. And I think that affected your president. I don't think he, he trusts 
foreign powers very easily. I don't think he trusts anybody very easily, and nor should he, because all countries uh, act within their own interests. And even Western foreign aid to Africa is in the interests of, of, uh, of both, really, of, of the country giving aid and the country receiving aid. I have no problem with that. That's why I don't think we should be giving foreign aid to North Korea or North Vietnam. And, uh, and I find it terribly foolish of the Americans to tell North Korea, if you don't build nuclear weapons, we'll give you food aid. They say, okay, they take food aid for a while and then go back to the nuclear weapons. Right. You know, the Americans have got to be nuts. Uh, uh, the, you know, the America, the old saying that uh, it's dangerous to be America's enemy, it's fatal to be her friend, you know. Uh, which is what might be what the president of Egypt is saying. Um, 